Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Hello and welcome to this episode. Coming up, we go back to September 1983 to get all the latest Sinclair news and Spectrum game releases. We head to the moon for our Moon Patrol arcade shootout. We step up to the Oki for some Spectrum darts. And we take a look at some newer titles. But first, it's back into our time machine in September 1983. Quicksilver release a program that will let users create their own arcade games. Games Designer, as it will be called, will allow users to create their own graphics and sound effects and build them into a game of their choice. The program is written by John Hollis and will be the first to be produced by a new company called Software Studios, set up by former Quicksilver staff John Hollis and Nick Lambert. Sinclair have revealed more details about its new professional computer currently being designed and built. It will include its own monitor and twin microdrives and should retail for around £800. The machine will have twin processors, a 68000 and a Z80. This will give users the option to run in different modes, including the possibility to run current Spectrum titles. Sinclair hope to enter the business market with this machine and challenge IBM with a cheaper alternative. Sinclair are taking legal action against a Hong Kong company for illegally using the design of the ZX81. Lambda Electronics are selling a machine called the Lambda 16K, and although it looks different from the outside, Sinclair say that the internals are almost identical. Sinclair hope to take out an injunction to stop the sale of the machine. Sinclair have released a new version of Motherboard for the Spectrum. The Series 3 was released to fix some ongoing issues, but has inadvertently created a new problem. The new units have a modified ULA chip to ensure compatibility with all colour televisions, unlike the previous version, but some older software now crashes. The issue is around the use of the IN command, which can cause any program that uses it to crash on the newer hardware. Sinclair unveiled their latest product, a portable flat screen television. The unit is just larger than a cigarette packet and costs four million pounds to develop. It will sell for around £79, which is cheaper than the recently released Sony competitor. The television is black and white only, but Sir Clive says he is now working on a colour version. And that was the news for September 1983, and now on to the top selling games. Manic Miner is still riding high this month, with those old favourites Jetpack, Penetrator, and even The Hobbit is making a late surge. New this month though are Trans Am, the new game from Ultimate, Test Match, the cricket game from CRL, Chess from Scion and Super Spy from Richard Shepard Software. And that was September 1983. Released in 1982 under license by Williams, this fondly remembered game had many redeeming features and still remains a firm favourite with retro fans. By this time, the graphics and sound capabilities of the arcade machines had improved from single coloured sprites and simple monotone tones, found emanating from early cabs. The bright colourful graphics with parallax scrolling and lovely animated buggy instantly drew players to it, but the main attraction was probably the tune that played along as you manoeuvred along the moon's surface. This particular game spawned many attempts on the humble spectrum, many written in basic, and for those games the reviews will be quite short and to the point. In other words, they were rubbish, but nevertheless, they have to be included. So, could any of the Spectrum clones match the arcade machine? First we have Casey Jones. For those not old enough, Casey Jones was the name of a steam train driver in the 60s television show, which was far better than this game. The game replaces the moon buggy of the arcade with a large steam locomotive, and the aliens with various nasties including hamburgers, all very odd really but no doubt trying to keep away from directly replicating the arcade game. The gameplay is smoothish, but very difficult, mainly due to the size of the main sprite. There is often nowhere to go to avoid the craters or the missiles being fired by the burgers. This quickly gets frustrating and you soon begin to look for something better to play. Next we have Escape from Alderaan. Obviously a Star Wars twist to this slow, jerky version written in BASIC, a truly appalling effort. Next we have Hovercraft, a game that could have been so much better. 
Why there is a need to stop gameplay just to display messages is beyond me and breaks up the flow of the game, otherwise this could be considered as an average effort. The graphics are okay, despite some glitches later on. This is not a bad game to try if you like Moon Patrol, but certainly not the best. Now on to Kamikaze Buggy. This is some kind of weird hybrid between Moon Patrol and Space Invaders. The aliens fly around above you, and as they land they scuttle across the screen, forcing you to jump over them. Jumping is almost uncontrollable, with your buggy leaping into the air nearly the full height of the screen, and drifting about in such a fashion that it makes it very difficult. This game tends to leave you stabbing randomly at buttons, hoping that you can avoid a sudden death. This game is not really recommended. Next we have Lunar Rover, and at last a game that provides a challenge, and some rather neat graphics. The jump height is based on how long you hold the key down, which can be tricky to get used to, but once you do, it becomes quite easy. You have to guess the length and height needed to get over any obstacles, but this can become frustrating pretty quickly. After you lose a life, the game is stopped to display a message, which interrupts gameplay. Never a good idea. The overhead aliens of the arcade are also missing. Instead we get horizontal meteorites that you have to dodge when jumping. The main letdown with this game is difficulty though. It's far too hard, and you quickly leave it behind, or find some pokes to make it easier. Next is Moon Alert, a game regarded as one of the better versions, and it's easy to see why. The graphics are good, the scrolling is smooth, the main sprite is large and well defined, and the controls are easy to get used to, and are quite responsive. The gameplay is also judged up just about right, allowing you to get just far enough into the game that, should you die, you want to get back in and have another try. Some of the arcade elements are missing, like the tanks for example, these have been replaced by mines, but it's still a great game. The sound is good and aliens fly around dropping bombs that leave craters just like the arcade machine. The whole thing is very polished, but you'd expect this from an ocean game. I still don't know why you get the Indiana Jones music at the end of each section, but still, a nice addition to an already good game. Next up is Moon Buggy, a very colourful entrant into the market. This version features nice landscapes that sadly move in 8 pixel jumps, although you are kept busy with the gameplay to notice. There is no left or right movement in the buggy, it's just in a fixed position. When you jump, the height and length of the jump is based on how fast you're going. The problem is there's no actual indication of how fast you're going, so it's all a bit random. All of this means the gameplay is usually short, ending with your buggy exploding after only a few seconds. This is not really a good game to play if you're a Moon Patrol fan. Next, another game called Moon Buggy. This could easily be missed out of these tests because there are many elements of the arcade missing. No scrolling landscape, no background scenery, and it's more of a space invaders on wheels really. You control a buggy that leaps about trying to dodge missiles and craters and meteorites as nasty aliens swarm above you. This is not actually a bad game, a bit difficult initially, but you soon get the hang of it. Is this a Moon Patrol clone though? I'll leave that up to you. And now we have a strange game. According to World of Spectrum, the author is unknown as is a lot of other details about the game. Moon Patrol starts with a rendition of the arcade tune, the only one to do this so far, and quickly sets you in the action. The background landscape scrolls smoothly, unlike the foreground which is a little jerky. The sound is very limited, but the gameplay is quite good. Sadly it seems that the background never changes, but still it's not a bad game but certainly not one of the best.
Now onto the official release from Atarisoft, Moon Patrol. This has all the elements of the arcade game. Overhead aliens, craters, tanks, smooth crawling, colourful backgrounds, backgrounds that change between sections. Everything's there, even the arcade music. The only downside is that there's no sound effects. Even if you turn the music off, the game plays in silence, which is a real pity because this is a really good game. The controls are responsive and the graphics are nice. The buggy does flicker sometimes, but this really can be excused because of the great gameplay. What we have here then is an official release that is actually better than the clones, although Ocean's Moon Alert does come pretty close. Next we have Return to the Moon, a clunky, silent, terrible game. Next please. And finally we have Terraplen, another infuriating game with tiny graphics, poor sound and bad controls. And the winner is... The Official Moon Patrol from Atarisoft. This is a great game and very close to the arcade. The gameplay is just right and I urge you to try it. I love a bit of darts, and it seems there have been dart games for almost every computer and console, even the Xbox and PlayStation. The Spectrum was no different, and there were several to choose from. In this episode we'll take a look at two of them, 180 by Mastertronic and Wacky Darts from Codemasters. We'll start with 180, released in 1986 under the MAD label. After configuring your keys or selecting a joystick, you are thrown straight into the action against the poorest player, Del Boy Desmond. The dartboard is nicely drawn, as is your hand as it wanders about the screen. Using the keyboard or joystick, you manoeuvre the hand to roughly where you want the dart to go, watching the animation at all times. Depending on the position of the hand and the animation, the dart will fly into the dartboard, hopefully where you want it. The movement of the hand is constant, like most dart games, which sees you prodding the keys to get the hand just in the right place before pressing the fire button. The hand rocks back and forth, as mentioned before, and if the hand is pulled back, the dart will go higher, so you have to take this into account when aiming. The scoring is done on the side panel, with your overall score and points scored. Sadly, there's no hint of checkouts, so you'll either have to be good at maths or darts, or both. Once you've taken your throw, the view changes to a scene of a pub and your challenger, as he aims at the board and throws. To say the first opponent is supposed to be the easiest, he seems quite good initially, and it does take a few goes to beat him. After several games though you'll soon get the hang of it, and I managed to get to the semi-finals after only three games. Overall then, not a bad game. The music does begin to get in the way, but apart from that, well worth a look. Moving on we have Wacky Darts from Codemasters, released in 1991. This version takes a wacky look at the game, as the title suggests, but at its heart it's still a good traditional dart game. After selecting your control type, you get to pick which player you want to throw against. Until you have played them you don't know which is the best, so sometimes you can end up starting with the best player, who completely wipes the floor with you. Luckily after a bit of trial and error you get to know who to start with, just to ease yourself into the game. Each of your opponents has their own trait. The Barbarian, for example, throws axes. He's not very good and proves easy to beat once you get the hang of the control system. As you work your way through, the games get harder as your opponents miss less and score higher. Your throw is taken in the usual way, manoeuvring your hand around the dartboard, keeping an eye on the animation and releasing the dart. I found the control system in this game a little easier on my initial tests, but strangely when I came back to it after playing 180, it somehow seemed more difficult. I suppose the control method that best suits you will win out in the end, so why not give both games a try? Back to this game and your opponents are shown side and top down, taking their shots in the style associated with their characters. Here the commentator rabbits on and the crowd shout out random things. 
This slows the game down and you soon find yourself prodding the key just to get to the gameplay. I worked my way through three challenges before it became tricky to match the scoring, but it was still an enjoyable game, despite the annoying interruptions. Another point, like the previous game, there is no hint of possible checkouts, a real pity, as I always ended up looking on the internet for checkout tables, or having a calculator to hand. This game, although not taking itself seriously, is still a solid dark game and a reasonable challenge. Both of the games in this episode I would recommend taking a look at, and which one you find best will be based on your skill level and interest in the game. Go on, get your darts out. This is Invasion of the Zombie Monsters, released in 2010 by Ravello. Ned and his girlfriend Linda are enjoying a quiet moment together when suddenly an evil being snatches Linda away. Ned is empowered by a moonray and sets off to rescue her. Using his new powers, our hero has to battle his way across the city, infested with zombies, so that he can reach his girlfriend and save her and the human race from this evil. The game is highly polished and quite obviously takes many ideas from the arcade classic Ghouls and Ghosts. The first thing you notice is the graphics though, for a spectrum they're really good, and use the limitations very cleverly. Although the screen scrolls in characters, in other words 8 pixels, this is hardly noticeable as your attention is fixed on the main character. Because of the 8 pixel scrolling, the game manages to keep its colours rather than having monotone or the famous colour clash problems. This makes it look brilliant. The gameplay is the same as the aforementioned Ghouls and Ghosts, with our hero moving from left to right, killing zombies, navigating platforms and collecting power-ups. The zombies vary from straight walking type, flying, bouncing and even some from outer space. All can be dealt with by a few light balls and there is nothing that proves too difficult. At the end of each stage there's a boss to battle and even for a bad gameplay like myself the difficulty is perfect meaning I can get to see more of the game. This is a great game to play with an easy learning curve, great graphics, great music and excellent gameplay. And as you may be able to tell, I like this game. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon. Mm -hmm.